this era starts us off with uh, focusing on the expansion of, of European kingdoms or the expansion of European empires. And this is big because for, for the rest of human history that we've talked about to this point, if you guys remember each, each era, according to Stearns and the way he ordered his chapters, do you guys remember that, that second period, the classical period? Do you remember what, what got talked about first, what, what civilization got talked about first? It was China. Chapter two in your book was China. All right? And then the second period that we talked about, the post-classical, uh, chapter 6 of your book, it's focused on what first? Islam. Islam, the, the development of Islam, right? So in that classical period, Peter Stearns at least, um, and most of, uh, of the world history textbooks, focuses on China. And then in the second post-classical era, we're focusing on the Islamic world. Now in this third period that starts in the year, four, around about the year 1450, we're starting with Europe. All right, so we're, we're, we're seeing definitely a sea change in global power and global dominance and global importance and in which society is impacting other societies the most. In that first era, we talked a lot about China. In that second era, it was the growth and expansion of Islam. And now we're focusing on Europe, okay? And from 1450 all the way to today, it is that Western world, so Western Europe and eventually the United States. Yes, ma'am. Sure, yeah. Those are sometimes the best things to read. And, and, and I think on, on two particular pages, I specifically had, I wanted you to read like the big blue thing. Um, I can't remember exactly off the top of my mind what that was, but yes, those are important to read. Okay, um, so before we get moving, I want to I give you a few reasons why these European countries want to expand and why they're going to be so darn good at doing it, all right? First, They've got a desire for overseas markets, all right? There are goods in other parts of the world that Europeans want to get their hands on. They've long wanted to get their hands on them. In particular, goods coming from the east, all right? Okay, yes, this is a very Eurocentric map, but this is like the map that most of us recognize that drops England right in the middle of it, right? Uh, it's, it's literally a Eurocentric map because Greenwich, England, where like these map makers first made this projection, made the prime meridian go right through their, their land. So zero degrees longitude goes right through England. So when we talk about the east, we're talking about the east from England. When we're talking about the west, we're talking about the west from England. All right. Uh, so they want to get to the east. They want to get to the riches of the east and the production of the east and the silk of the east and the spices of the east. That's where they want to get to. For most of human history before this time period, before the 1400s, if you are here, how do you connect with here? Silk Road. Okay. There's the land trade routes of the Silk Road, or you're going to the Mediterranean, you're getting some camel caravans, maybe across to the Persian Gulf or across the, uh, uh, to the Red Sea. You're hopping in the Indian Ocean trade network, and that's a long way. And you've got to go through who? Who controls this land in the middle? Yeah, we're going to talk about them very soon, but it, it's Muslims. It's the Ottoman Empire, right? And so the Christian empires in the Western world don't want to pay these middlemen these guys who are really just raising the price on all of these goods that they're, they're trading, right? Uh, they're, they're facilitating the trade from east to west, but there's a lot of taxes and tolls that are being paid as traders go through the Ottoman lands. So wouldn't it be great if you're a Christian empire, especially if you're a Christian state like, like Spain, who has a special hatred in their heart for Islam? Why? Very good, because Spain was once conquered by Islamic empires, right? Muslim Iberia, Al-Andalus. So Spain was once conquered by Muslim Iberia. But in the 13 and finally culminating in the 1400s, Spain was reconquered by Christianity. And so the Spaniards and the Portuguese to a lesser extent, they feel they have like a special role in Catholic Christianity to spread Catholicism often at the expense of Islam. And what better way to do that than when you're trading with the East to avoid these guys altogether. 
find a way to the east without having to go through the Muslim lands of the Middle East. Uh, Alex. Uh, so, the, okay. So I was confused. Isn't there a canal? Where, where was it fixed later on? But I, I believe there's... There is a canal, but that's not going to be dug until the late 1800s. It's called the Suez Canal. Yeah, not, so you, I, I, what I'm saying is you can't go through there anyway because there wasn't a canal there. No. Well, you, you, you can take your ships here, unload your ships, carry your stuff to other ships. Yeah, you got to, like, hoof it. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> that's, about, that's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. how do you travel? It's still, still worth it. Like, you don't think it's a lot of work going over the Silk Road? Like, I mean... That's less work than you're doing that. Like, you're not... Like, <laughs> you can, they can handle it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Because, oh, why wouldn't they want to spread their religion there? Because they're already Muslim. It, it's, human history shows that it's really hard to convert um, people that believe in a, a long-lasting universalist faith. When, when, by that I mean like, like Islam and Christianity are both my way or the highway kind of religions. Like my religion is right, everything else is wrong, and this is what I was born into, so this is what I'm going to be. If, if one is already a Christian... It's hard to convert that person to anything else. If one is already a Muslim, it's hard to convert that person to anything else. Because especially within Christianity and Islam, they've been learning for their whole lives that the other side is wrong. Now, other people that don't know anything about Christianity or don't know anything about Islam or, or, or anything else, uh, or maybe just have traditional beliefs, they might be easier to convert to that new faith. But it, it's hard to convert Muslims. Um, it, it's not really happening a lot. Um, and, and vice versa. Muslims don't convert a ton of Christians to, to, to their faith. Uh, so not only is it going to be harder to convert them, when you're traveling through their lands, you are taking your wealth and paying it to the Ottoman Empire. So you're making the Ottoman Empire richer at your expense. So, yeah, you could go that way, but if you can find a cheaper way to do it and not have to give any of your wealth to a Muslim empire, that's the best option for, for these Christian empires. Africa, yes. Um, so, they're going to be looking for ways to avoid the Muslim Ottoman Empire. And you can do that in one of two ways. You can go south, around the southern tip of Africa, or eventually they're going to learn that you can go west. And yes, what proves that it is far cheaper for European kingdoms like Spain or Portugal to go all the way around the southern tip of Africa to get to the Indies, or even to go all the way around the planet to get to the East Indies. What proves that that is a cheaper way to do it than going through the middle of, of the world, going through the Middle East, going through the Muslim lands? What is the absolute proof that that is the cheaper way to do it? Yes. They did it. They did it is great proof that, that that's what works best. If that didn't work best, if that was far more expensive... Like, if it, just building the ships and transversing the oceans was far more expensive than going through the Middle East, they probably would have still gone through the Middle East, even if they had to pay Muslim middlemen for the trading. All right? So the fact that they did it shows that that was the better way to do it. We're also going to, at this time period, have advancements in shipmaking and navigational techniques. We're going to talk more about this at a later date. So we're not going to worry too much today about that. That's another standard. We're going to talk about some advancements in shipmaking and navigational techniques. One thing Western Europe has, though, that the rest of the world doesn't, or certainly another great power like China, is you've got a lot of competition between states. And guys, we're in America. We love some competition, don't we? And you've got in Western Europe, Spain, Portugal, France, Britain, the Netherlands, all competing against each other, all building their own ships, all building their own navies, all desiring to find access to the rich markets of, of the East, competing against each other. Look at the, the various auto companies out, out right now, right? 
What, the existence of Ford and General Motors and Toyota and Honda and Fiat Chrysler, they, their very existence and their competition against each other does what for all of the cars that they make? It makes them cheaper and makes them better, right? If there was only one auto company, the cars would be lousy. Anybody looking to buy some vintage Soviet Union made cars? That's what I was going to say. No. No. Okay? Competition t makes products better. Because if you don't make better products, if you don't make better products, people will buy your competitors' products, right? The iPhone gets better and better and better because Samsung gets better and better and better at making phones. All right? So Western Europe has competition between states. China, they've got no competition. We've used this phrase before. They can kind of rest on their laurels. They have no local competition that threatens them. Western Europe's got all kinds of it. So if Spain starts making better ships with bigger guns and bigger sails that can go faster on the ocean, Portugal better work to keep up. Britain better work to keep up with that, all right? Or they'll lose out. We've also, I've already mentioned this briefly, but especially for Spain, to a lesser extent Portugal, you've got the, uh, the, the desire to spread Catholic Christianity. Especially Spain. Spain, um, on the Iberian Peninsula, they were victorious in the Reconquista, the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula for Catholic Christianity. You should also be aware of, of something known as the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, the Spanish Inquisition, um, an Inquisition is just a religious court. Um, and it would, uh, it would basically put on trial people that are challenging the, the church or people that challenge church doctrine. The Spanish Inquisition would grow tremendously in the 1400s and into the 1500s. Spain became like the forefront of questioning people's religious beliefs and, and that they're adhering in the proper way to the Catholic doctrine. So, so the desire to spread Catholic Christianity to other parts of the world. Well, what do you got once you get into the Americas? You've got a lot of people. Once you get into Africa, you've got a lot of people that can become Christian. And then there's a desire for personal gain. All of these explorers, these people that are venturing across the ocean on a horribly dangerous trip, they can get land, they can get riches, they can possibly get fame and glory. Maybe things that weren't available to them in Europe. There were opportunities overseas. So for all of these reasons, European nations are going to venture into the open seas. I think the most important of all of them, just having quicker, cheaper connections to markets. All right? Yes, the spreading of religion is big. Yes, the desire for personal uh, riches is important. Uh, but the, the connection to the trade markets of the East, that's the most important. Yes? Well, I feel like it didn't, uh, if it wasn't for the Ottoman Empire, they wouldn't have done this either. Sure. Yes? Primarily them, um, they, we've got the Netherlands as well. Uh, so we got Netherlands and France, and, and yeah, that, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Yeah, no. Because if you're, if you're Greece and you're Italy, you're kind of hanging out in the Mediterranean. You're stuck in the Mediterranean. All the rest of these, notice what they have, like Atlantic coastlines. Uh, so, yeah, we don't really see a lot coming from... Uh, from Eastern Europe. Yes, sir? Isn't it because Italy was not even, like, unified? Italy is not a, in, Italy is a place where we're dealing with city-states. Uh, so Italy is not a unified country until the 1800s. And also the Greeks were occupied by Ottomans as well. So there yeah, like there you go. Good call. Yeah. And Germany didn't even exist yet. So Germany was the Holy Roman Empire, which wasn't very holy, Roman, or much of an empire. Landlocked. Yeah. Was and landlocked, yeah. Was that during, like, the House of the Lord? Do you know, was that during the city? Um, same time period, but that's Italy. Uh, the, the Borgias are, are Italian. Um, okay, anyway, let's, let's get into some specific countries. First, we've got to talk about Portugal. Portugal should be easy to remember that they're on the forefront of it all because they are geographically situated to be on the forefront of it all. Portugal, right? It's like the fingertip if, if well, let's say, let's, say, let's say Spain is the big toe of Europe. 
Portugal is like the fingernail on the big toe of Europe. Um, okay, that, that's maybe not cool to Spain. But big toes are really, like, I, I think if you didn't have, wouldn't you be falling over left and right if you didn't have a big toe? Like, your big toe is really important. Yes? Does Spain have, like, it's really confusing to see that, uh, when you say, like, Portugal is literally surrounded by Spain, and then they still manage to, like, not, like, Portugal still managed not to get devoured. Like, what, yeah. what, what's the problem? Like, how do um, they agree to the they signed, they signed an agreement yeah. to split the land? Oh, okay. So it, then, it's then just two separate kingdoms. And it's port Portugal. Portugal. Portugal also has ports. <laughs> they do have ports. Yes, they're, they're on the coast. So anyway, let's, let's press ahead. So Portugal, first and foremost, they are strategically located. Again, we want to remember that we can't, if we are of Portuguese descent, we can't pat ourselves on the back too much and say, look at how wonderful we are because we ushered in this age of European exploration because they were just geographically lucky. They were in the right spot to do it, all right? And they had a royal family that was willing to put up some money to support this because these are expensive endeavors. So you've got to have the kingdom supporting these overseas expansions. And it just so happens that within the royal family, we've got a guy named Prince Henry who becomes known as Prince Henry the Navigator because he's quite fond of getting out into the open seas and looking at what's going on um, in, dis in more distant lands. Uh, they, they fund a navigation school so young people can go, young men, come on, uh, young men can go to the school to learn how to better sail on the open seas. And so Portugal becomes the first country to start venturing beyond its, its borders um, out into the open seas. So we can see here in this purple line, we've got some voyages sponsored by Henry himself. Then we've got a couple other lines of names that you should be familiar with. Uh, in 1488, a guy named Bartolomeo Diaz. You can just write D-I-A-S, D-I-A-S, Diaz. Is going to be the first European to sail around the southern tip of Africa, which they bestow as the Cape of Good Hope. It was originally referred to as the Cape of Storms, but nobody thought that that would be a good selling point. Like, who would really want to go down to the Cape of Storms and travel around the southern tip of Africa where your ships might get bashed upon rocks? Let's call it the Cape of Good Hope instead. Names matter. When did he do this? Uh, 1488, Bartolomeo Diaz uh, sails around the southern tip of Africa, and what does he do? He's like the first European to get to the southern tip of Africa and say, whoa, you can get around this thing. And I want us for a second to imagine what it must have been like in the 1400s to not really know there was an end to this. All right? Because no one had ever been, no, none of these people had ever been down there. So that's a big deal. You can get around it. He goes back up to Portugal. He says, you can get around it. And a few years later, we have another even more important guy named Vasco da Gama, D-A-G-A-M-A, -A -A, in 1497. Vasco da Gama will follow much of the same route as Bartolomeo Diaz. Obviously, he takes a wrong turn here a little bit, but um, <laughs> he will also sail around the southern tip of Africa, make it into port cities in East Africa. What cities is he arriving in when he goes through Mozambique and Mombasa? What do we call these? The Swahili city-states. So now you have a white European navigator making his way into East African city-states. And then from there, he hops into southern India. So Portugal is going to be that first European nation that makes it to India by sea route. Now, he's not the first European in India. That's crazy. But he's the first European to make it into India via sea route. And look what he did. He told Portugal, we can totally get here and trade with these people without ever doing business with the Ottoman Empire. Yay for Portugal. Portugal mostly focused on setting up trading posts on West Africa and in the Indian Ocean. Because Portugal is a relatively small country with a relatively small population, and they were not able to take over territories wholesale. For example, Portugal is the first European gunpowder empire. They can, they've got guns on these ships, right? That makes it to India. 
But the tiny Portuguese nation can't conquer India or take over India. It's far too big. So they set up trading posts and trading arrangements. That's all they do. So East Africa and the uh, Indian Ocean? Yep. As time goes on, as we get into the 1600s and certainly into the 1700s, Portugal, because it's so small, is going to start losing out to bigger sea powers like England and the Netherlands. But they start it off. So good job, Portugal. When did they decline? Eh, 1600s, 1700s. Now on to Spain. In 1492, you guys are probably familiar with the little story of Christopher Columbus. And he goes to Queen Isabella in Spain, and he's like, hey, I've got this great idea. We can get to the east by going west. His only problem was he wasn't quite as sure uh, as others were about how big the earth was, nor was he quite as sure about the existence of this roadblock getting in the way from heading uh, to the, the East Indies. But anyway, he got the funding from the Queen and King of, of Spain to travel to the East by going West. He's going to land in what he is going to name Hispaniola, which is today the countries of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. But he also pops into Cuba and a couple other islands of the Caribbean. And he begins to stake the claim for Spain on the Caribbean and eventually what will become known as New Spain, which is Central America today. Heck, all those places of the Americas that speak Spanish. Crazy. Not long after Columbus's journey in 1494, the Pope is going to have to lay down the law. Portugal, Catholic. Spain, Catholic. Do we remember that in Western Europe, kings are important, but the Pope is, like, important-er, right? So the Pope is going to work out an agreement between these two countries. And this is called the Treaty of Tordesillas. T-O-R-D. E-S-I-L-L-A-S, -L the Treaty of Tordesillas. It essentially draws a line down the Atlantic Ocean. And here's our 1494 line, which is the one that's going to live uh, for, for a few centuries. The Pope will draw a line, and he says, Portugal, you can stake a claim to the east of that line, which is like where Africa is, and importantly, it's where Brazil is. All right, or at least the eastern tip of Brazil. Because there was one Portuguese explorer, we don't need to worry about his name, but it's a guy named Cabral, who was trying to go the same way all the other Portuguese explorers were, but whoa, it got windy, and he landed on the coast of Brazil. And so that's why our friends from Brazil speak Portuguese. They don't speak Spanish. They speak Portuguese down in Brazil. But everything to the west of that line of demarcation, everything to the west of that line in the Treaty of Tordesillas, is going to be, uh, or is, is rightfully, a Spanish claim. So that's why everything else becomes Spain. Now, what about all this stuff? That's like west of the line. Is that what you're going to ask? No, no, no. Okay. All this stuff is west of the line? Yeah, but that's going to be landed on by, like, England later. And they ain't even Catholic for much of this time. So we're not going to worry about them. Yes? The Pope. The Pope. Well... But you don't mess with the Pope. If, you're, if you are a, a Catholic Spanish king or a Catholic Portuguese king and, and like you feel that you are on the front lines of, of, of defending the Catholic faith, you're going to listen when the Pope, like the number one Catholic in the world, tells you what's up? You're going to listen. It's not weird. It's not weird. Yeah. Is when, when they signed the Treaty of Tordesillas, did... did did it, did it have a clause of what time, like, limit this treaty, or is it, like, forever? I, I, I... Because, like, if, the why is, like, there's still, like, two countries is still, like, yeah. today, right? Then why do Brazil, like, go over? Ah, there's a whole lot that, like, yeah, we've, we've got independence fights and things like that, and eventually weakening of the Catholic Church. Okay, we're going to press on, we're going to press on. In 1519, another, another Spaniard, Ferdinand Magellan. He's heading around the southern tip of South America, and he's like, whoa, what is that? There's a big signpost right down here that said the Straits of Magellan. And he's like, that's totally named after me. I should go through there. 
and he sailed through the Straits of Magellan. I'm kidding. They named it after him, after he went through it. <laughs> but he sails through the Straits of Magellan, and he makes his way all the way across the Pacific Ocean, all the way, well, we don't have it over here. Now he's into Asia, right? All the way into, uh, into the East Indies. And he's like, hey, the Philippines, let's take a break. Oh, natives killed me. But the rest of my people, you finish the journey. And Magellan's people, Magellan's people made it all the way back to Spain. And so Ferdinand Magellan is kind of remembered now to be the first guy to almost circumnavigate the globe. He just died in the Philippines. But his ships made it the rest of the way. So Spain makes it all the way around. And, and, and the Philippines becomes eventually a Spanish colony. In 1519, in 1519, we get Hernan Cortez. Cortez. Arriving in Mexico with 600 men. And when he arrives in Mexico with 600 men, he runs into some natives, and the natives are like, hey, you look like you could do some trouble. We've got these people that, like, keep taking our people and ripping their hearts out. Why don't we show you how to get to them? And Cortez is like, awesome, let's do it. And other natives help Cortez and his men make their way to the Aztec capital called? Tenochtitlan. And there he is, he is greeted by the Aztec king Montezuma as a god. Because you've got this like white dude on a horse. And white dudes have never been seen before by the Aztec. And horses have never been seen by the Aztec. So he must be a god. And he's wearing shiny things on his head. And he must be a god. And unfortunately for the Aztec, he wasn't a god, nor was he a very good guy. Uh, and when, when the king of the Aztecs started greeting and gifting to Hernando Cortez gifts of gold, it made Cortez's eyes go wide, and it made him lust for more. And ultimately, Cortez and his 600 Spaniards, bring, with guns, bring an end to the Aztec Empire. Uh, we call Hernando Cortez a conquistador because he's a conqueror of the Aztec. He is also, um, we should also think about him, uh, along with a guy named Francisco Pizarro. Francisco Pizarro, who will do much the same to the Inca in South America. So Cortez in the, of the Aztec and Pizarro, who conquers the Incan Empire, that's a few years later in 1531, ultimately creating a Spanish empire in the Americas. Yes? He conquered the Inca. Cortez conquers the Aztec. Pizarro conquers the Inca. And so now Spain has a global empire. Now, one side note. There is not very good treatment of Native Americans by the Spaniards. We're going to talk about this much more later. There's not very good treatment. And most Spaniards were totally cool about this. All right? They didn't see the natives as, as equal human beings. One guy did, though. His name was Bartolomeo de las Casas. You guys can see his name here. Bartolomeo de las Casas. We're going to look at some of his writings in a little bit. Uh, but Bartolomeo de las Casas wrote a book critiquing Spanish treatment of natives in America. And there's a lot of, like, drawings and, and wood carvings. You can see Spaniards lopping off the hands of natives here. Uh, pretty rough stuff. So there was at least some critique coming from Spaniards uh, against the poor treatment of, of them. The Spanish Empire in the Americas was focused on the extraction of raw materials, particularly gold, but what they got most of all was silver. This is a mountain in present-day Bolivia called Potosi. It's a mountain called Potosi in present-day Bolivia. And in this drawing, you guys can make out a bunch of natives who are mining that mountain to extract the silver. It was literally a mountain of silver in South America. They were focused on mineral mining, extracting wealth from the Americas. The Spain, Spaniards, Spanish. And they would use this wealth to fund further exploration and the expansion of their empire. Two more notes and then we're going to run to lunch. In 1571, in 1571, as a highlight of the growing power that Spain was, Spanish a Spanish fleet will meet an Ottoman fleet in the Mediterranean Sea. 
and they will do battle at what is known as the Battle of Lepanto, where Spanish navies will defeat the Ottoman Empire on the open sea in, in the Mediterranean. This is going to stop the expansion of the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean and be a feather in the cap of, of Spanish dominance on the seas. But that does not last long. We should, if we know anything about world history, we know that good times can't always be around. And empires, just as they rise, they are also going to fall. In 1588, the great Spanish fleet will have a disaster befall them as they will sail north from Spain into England. There's a lot of backstory here, and a lot of it surrounds a guy named Henry VIII. You guys might have heard of Henry VIII. We'll talk about him on a later date as well. In an extremely nutshell version of the story that you don't need to write down, Henry VIII was a king of England. He had a wife. He had many wives. One of his wives was Catherine, Catherine of Aragon, that's like Spain. She was the, the daughter of the Spanish king. And Henry was not too happy that Catherine didn't bear him a son. Henry wanted a divorce. The Pope was like, you can't get divorced. So Henry was like, you can't make me follow your religion. So Henry started a brand new religion called the Church of England, which is just like Catholicism, except... Well, yeah, he broke from the Catholic Church. Starts a new religion called the Church of England, with the only difference from the Catholic Church and the Church of England is that the Pope is no longer a thing in the Church of England. The king is number one, and Henry could get his divorce. So an angry King Philip down in Spain is going to send his fleet up to defend Catholicism and to defend his daughter, and they will get trapped in the English Channel and the Spanish Armada will be routed by the English Navy. Uh, so here we be, are going to begin to see a shift in the balance of power in Western Europe. Spain was at maybe a high point before this time. Now we're going to see the rise of England. And this is in 1588. I want